Welcome to the Flower Lounge, a place for conversations with wildly creative people and a little plant-loving wisdom to help you experience life in full bloom. I'm Katie Hess, flower alchemist and founder of Lotus Way, and I believe in a world where we're all living at our personal edge. Welcome to the Flower Lounge. I am so excited for this week. This is around a topic that I am personally really passionate about in terms of like what I do in my free time as a little secret hobby that no one knows about. And I am so thrilled to have Sasha Duar on the show. She's an artist and a designer who works with plant-based palettes, natural dyes, and place-based recipes. She's a professor at the California College of Arts with a joint appointment in textiles and fine arts where she designs curriculum and teaches courses and the intersection of, this is so interesting, natural color, slow food, slow fashion, and social practice. Her work has been shown in galleries and museums across the U.S. and abroad. And in 2007, Sasha founded Permaculture Institute to encourage the exploration of regenerative design practices for fashion and textiles. Her extensive work with plant-based palettes and ecological principles through local land-based sources and community has been featured in the New York Times, American Craft Magazine, Selvage, and the Huffington Post. And she's author of the most beautiful book that you have to get because, I mean, even if you just look at the photos, it's so exquisite. I have it. It's called The Handbook of Natural Plant Dyes and Natural Color. She lives with her husband and children on their urban farm in Oakland, California. Thank you so much, Sasha, for being here. Thank you, Katie. Well, I'm very happy to be a part of this. And any chance I get to talk and communicate with those who work and love plants is a blessing to me. Yay! <laughs> so excited. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I just like, this is kind of like this little secret hobby for me that I would like take little pieces of fabric or like silk pillowcases and kind of go nuts with the pot in the kitchen with hibiscus flowers and turmeric powder and coffee and clove and like see what different colors come out but I I just sort of do it for fun and as a gift and have never worked with mordants Mm -hmm. and and yet I'm just like super fascinated by this topic so why don't we talk about what your Actually, why don't we start off with an exercise that I always do with people, and that's to close your eyes and go back to your childhood, to a time when you played around flowers or plants or trees, and just think about what you were doing at the time and who you were with, and what might be your favorite flower from that time or plant or tree, or what pops in your mind first. And then if you could describe the personality of that in three words, what would it be? And then whenever whenever you're ready, you can open your eyes and just tell me what you were thinking about, what was going on, what was your plant, and what the three words are to describe it. Okay. Well, ironically, I write just about this at the beginning of my book in the introduction because my childhood is a huge part of how I got to where I am and how much I love plants. I grew up between Maine and Hawaii as a child. And so when I was really little, I lived on an organic Christmas tree farm. Wow. And I used to play in the puddles when it was, you know, either when the snow was melting or when it was just starting to rain in the fall. And I used to play in the puddles and I would love taking little spruce cones and Mm -hmm. To the petals and making them smell really good, and also seeing what colors would happen, which is surprising because you'd get kind of purpley colors and reds from it. But it was mostly that feeling of being enveloped, like in this little world that you know included all of these elemental factors like water and you know the sense of smell and you know beauty and imagination and kind of magic that would happen where these materials would get transformed or interact with each other and so you know it just kind of became an alchemical way of feeling a part of the whole environment to me Mm. and I still feel like that with my dye baths I feel like it's just a way to feel like I'm one with (laughs) for lack of better words but one with everything you know so Mm. and I still love working with especially with 
pines and spruces and so for you it would be spruce pine redwood or sort of like an overall evergreen coniferous kind of yeah. tree yeah that's it's definitely a very i mean it's literally a seed i think of where this all started for me wow and how would you if you think of those trees if you were to try to distill it to three words how would you describe their personality I would say I think effervescent would be one as well as calming and intrinsic mm. that's beautiful what we find is that how you describe the your childhood favorite is typically how you bring your gifts into this world and effervescent calming and intrinsic that sounds pretty amazing and I heard you use some other words as you were describing the whole experience which very much sounds like your work beautiful magical imaginative transformative alchemical and one with everything <laughs> Just about sums it up <laughs> Oh my goodness. Okay. So there's so many things I want to talk about. There's some things from your book, like terminology that I just love, like weeding your wardrobe and foraging for fashion and seasonal dyes and slow fashion. So let's start out though, really slow. And just at, by asking you, what are some of your favorite botanicals to work with for natural dyes? Well, I think one of the reasons why, especially with this book, Natural Color, I structured it seasonally is because I love, like, I love connecting to what's around me when it's happening and paying attention to it. And that can really differ from season to season or year to year. So it's hard to choose just one, but a few favorites that I have. Um, I love how things smell especially so I think I've curated over the past few years like especially loving dye baths where I love the smell of them mm -hmm. and so you know some of those like even just making like distilling rose petals or steaming rose petals mm -hmm. that's always a favorite because it's just so lovely and other I mean even plants you wouldn't necessarily know like have a really kind of interesting or unique smell to them mm -hmm. like certain types of leaves like right now it's fall turning into winter in the bay area and we have a lot of good ambar leaves or sweet sweet gum leaves falling from the trees and collecting those when they're nice and red and mm. and collecting those and putting them into the pot and you don't need a mordant i also love plants where you don't need mordants to work oh. with them Oh, oh, oh. They already in, have a mordant within them, like, a, you know, strong tannin. These leaves, when you put them into the water and you heat them up, it smells just like nutmeg. Like, it's a really beautiful smell. Wow. And it's one of those things where otherwise you might not think twice as you're walking down the street, but it's always a favorite plant to work with. And there's just, you know, there's, there's basically a short little window from October through the beginning of January where they're fresh and you know, have that really dis distinct, strong, nutmeggy smell to them. So, wow. And what color, what color, what color uh, comes out? Like an antique pink, I would say, not unlike colors you might see from avocado pit or, you know, mm -hmm. light dips of matter, you know, it's just like a really beautiful natural pink. And then as soon as you add iron to it, it can go to purpley grays or steely blues or black. Mm, wow. And when you add iron, like, are you talking about like putting a bunch of rusty nails in water and soaking it or? I mean, there's a few different modes to get to the same place, but um, you can create your own iron like liqueur basically by taking rusty objects and letting them steep and even adding a tiny bit of something to break the iron down, like citrus, for instance, or vinegar, and to just kind of help extract more of the iron out of the metals. So that's one way to do it. And another way is, especially if you're, you know, if you're a designer and you're not wanting to corrode your fibers, because iron can be corrosive, and measuring out, you only need just such a tiny bit or tiny amount, but you can measure out the powder and it's really just 2% of the weight of your fiber. It's a very little, wow. little bit to go a long way. So. And, and like you were saying, um, this particular, the sweet gum leaves don't actually, if you didn't want to shift the color, if you loved that antique yeah. light pink, yeah. you don't need a mordant. And are there, are there yeah. other plants that don't need mordants? Oh yeah, 
there's, I mean, mostly <laughs> it depends on which fibers you're working with too, because sometimes mm -hmm. fibers in the dyes have their own particular way of bonding, but there are many mordants that you can forego a mordant. They're substantive <laughs> or substantive dyes, which mm -hmm. means they have a mordant already within the plant itself or a binder within the plant. And so, and also too, I'm a big proponent, like this is part of the work that we do in the classes that I teach and also just kind of thinking critically about usage of our, our clothing and textiles. But, you know, some plants you don't want to stay on your clothes forever because you'd rather have it go off into your skin, especially if you're not mm. using a mordant, like turmeric, for instance, even though it fades, mm. it's a very strong medicinal dye because it's, you know, your skin absorbs quite a bit of, you know, up to 60% of what you put onto it. Mm -hmm. And so having some, some clothes you do want to imbue with, with dye and have that dye then become something that might move from textile onto your body in a different way. Mm. Anything else. I um, love that. So not using a mordant, you're not, maybe your end goal is not necessarily to keep that color at the same <laughs> level without it moving mm. into another form. I love that so much because yeah, you're talking about different goals. And I I've never used mordants before. And I, <laughs> you know, sometimes I feel a little bit silly because if I give them as gifts and then over time people wash them and then the, you know the yeah. pink hibiscus washes out. But I've also worked with turmeric. And so if I made a couple silk pillowcases out of turmeric. Oh, granted, some of that's going away in the yeah. washing machine when I wash it. But so what you're saying is that if I then sleep on those pillowcases, some of that turmeric is rubbing off into my skin on my face, right? Most likely, yep. Wow. <laughs> and you can think about that too. I mean, even just when you're thinking of a garment that's synthetically dyed or dyed in general with anything like a black dress and washing a black dress in, in a sink, you can see the dye that comes off of that. And even your own body, like sweating, of course, you have like that same kind of, I don't know, like witness interaction of the dye in your body happening too. So it's, a, you know, it's something to consider. But I would, I would also say there's, you know, there's a lot of cultural traditions and cues to look at in every place around the world and even like textiles that are considered more fortunate to give or to gift often like I'm I'm actually looking at an indigo dyed blanket right now in the room that I'm sitting in and mm -hmm. you know the darker the indigo is usually considered luckier to have because you think about the caking that comes off of that indigo and indigo is really a great antiseptic for your skin and healing towards wounds and mm. anti-inflammatory and indigo also helps you with insomnia and anxiety so I think it's an ideal pillow die <laughs> wow I love that also, you know for bedding in general sleeping on indigo is really great Another thing I talk, I talk quite a bit about medicinal dyeing in this last book, and it's a core part of kind of my practice with plant dyeing, but also how I like to think about these. I love thinking about all of these plants holistically, mm -hmm. and, you know, it's also interesting to combine some of these plants together and have similar qualities like indigo and passion vine. Passion vine is also helpful for insomnia and for anxiety. And so one of the first openers of my book, I have a textile that's, that's dyed with fresh indigo from my garden and also um, forage passion fruit vines from my neighbor, but them coming together into a combination of a color, I think is also really fascinating when you think about, you know, plant dye medicine becoming your textiles and then also how you use them or how you, you know, share or gift them too in terms of, thinking of their qualities. Mm. So I think there's a lot of, I mean, there, there has and is a lot of potential that has been worked with these plants on so many different levels throughout history and every culture. Mm. It's really interesting for us to, you know, just continue this conversation and be aware to it and conscious of it. Yeah. Just because just because you mentioned your project, I'm gonna like really quickly read. I've got your beautiful book in front of me, and um, oh, thank you. <laughs> and just just to throw it out there because I think, yeah, oh my God, like, so the listeners can get a sense of what's in this book. She's got it listed out into seasons, 
which is just brilliant, right? Because I imagine she's thinking what's available during each season in spring. So there's a ton of projects here, but I'm just going to read a couple off to you that are fascinating. Avocado pit pillowcases, rose petal curtains, oxalis child's dress. And that is this little yellow flower that makes the most brilliant, like almost fluorescent yellow, crazy chartreuse color. In the summer, a couple projects listed are aloe tunic, bedding, hibiscus summer hat, in the fall, there's Hopi black sunflower seed wool rug, dying with persimmons. Yum, my favorite fruit. In the winter, we've got pomegranate rind cocktail napkins, red cabbage baby hat and mittens, blue spruce chunky wool blanket. And these are just like a few in the book. So highly recommended, absolutely beautiful. And each of these projects is so exquisite. The it's so, That's so interesting you dye with persimmon. And I have a friend from Korea and he used to give me clothing that was dyed with persimmon yeah. have well, you I, well I write about it I actually ended up writing an essay about persimmon in this book because to me it's one of the the more fascinating you know plant colorings to work with it's actually not a dye which is so interesting it's it's a coat so it can make fibers stronger by working with and it by working with persimmon as a coating and Trish Korea has a really strong history of working with persimmon dye as well as Japan mm-hmm. and Japan they call it they call it kakishibu uh-huh. and yeah it's just it's it's a fascinating color because I think I was actually just talking about this in a lecture a couple of days ago to a garden club and one of the things that I love about it is because not only is this colorant from it's from really astringent persimmons so the green persimmons mm-hmm. so you're thinking in terms of seasonality you're thinking very specifically about when you want to collect and ferment these persimmons and it can be used on wood to kind of coat wood surfaces it can also wow. be used to coat all different types of fibers, but it will especially make fibers stronger. So for workwear, it like gives extra durability to clothing. If it's painted on, it gets darker in the sun, which I think is also great because you think about how sometimes dyes can fade or they could even get darker, especially if they have a lot of tannins in them, like the persimmon does. And then Worthly, what I love about it is because I was also just at a conference on textiles and pollution. Another fascinating thing is that you can coat rainwear with it. And instead mm-hmm. of having all the toxic chemicals that go into water resistant clothing or into active wear, thinking about something like persimmon, which then makes your fiber stronger, but is also UV resistant and waterproof. It wow. Waterproof sealant. So even like, you know, painting rice paper, which has been done traditionally in many cultures, but Mm -hmm. specifically in Korea and in Japan, painting rice paper with persimmon paint then also creates like an umbrella that is functional to work with and to be able to use and blocks out the light in a extra UV protective way. And then also is good for water resistance so wow fascinating the power of a plant like something just like an unripe persimmon like all that possibility and also usefulness that comes out of that in terms of translating it into the textile world is kind of phenomenal <laughs> you wow. never take anything for granted so wow that's incredible yeah. uv resistant waterproof makes the fibers stronger protects you from pollution That's amazing. And are there, like, if we kind of circle back a little bit more to the art of medicinal color, which I just Mm -hmm. find so fascinating, Mm -hmm. what are some other plants and uh, botanicals that you work with that have really, like, a strong foothold in the art of medicinal colorings? And, and, you know, what are the things that you think of, like, wanting to get into your skin and body? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I, I try to think about and curate. I always teach a block on medicinal dyeing in my textile classes at California College of the Arts. So I love working with herbalists too and with people who work with these plants on different levels. I feel like, you know, there's always things to learn from them, as you know. But I would say one of my favorite all time dyes too, where you also do not need a mordant added to it, is aloe. And so aloe, I mean, obviously is really great for your skin, but it's such a beautiful color and such like in a kind of an imbued glowing palette that happens from it. And so even just working with the leaves and the kind of the juice of the aloe is really simple and a really beautiful way to just kind of 
give love to your clothing and to give it, you know, beauty and design at the same time. And then if you add alkalinity to your water that you're working with or to your dye bath, it can shift the color from like kind of this warm glowing yellow to coral or to pink. And that's also like a fascinating thing to think about. And I love kind of pushing that or working with that in general. It's funny when you add, you see, when you add alkalinity, it turns coral because that, I think of the flowers being yeah. that color. And they are, they are really, I mean, depending on the variety, but there's some where it's just like, you get these super bright oranges and wow. gorgeous. And when you, for, for someone who doesn't know anything about dyeing, how do you add alkalinity? Well, there's several different ways. And this is something else I talk about in my book, because there's, you know, of course, it's so some of these ways of shifting colors can be so subtle too. And it's always good to keep a little dyer's notebook as you go through the process yourself, because it's always, you know, the combination of when you harvested the plant, like what you add to the water, what the water is already that you're working with, the pH of it. Mm -hmm. um, these all matter in terms of the colors that you can get. And so adding alkalinity to water, if your water's not already alkaline, you can do in a few different ways, but just using like wood ash, like from a fireplace is one, using different, you know, you can subtly shift it with different types of salts. There's also like you know, some people have worked or some cultures have worked with ground up shells. You can work with, you know, like soda ash, which can be pretty high alkalinity, but is easy to obtain from textile suppliers to change the pH. And then other ways, sometimes I work with salt. And when I, in the recipe that I have <laughs> in the book, because I took, it's a summer recipe for aloe. And a suggestion I have is even working with salt water too. Mm -hmm even though it's just a slight pH up towards mm -hmm. alkalinity. It's a really beautiful way of thinking environmentally and, you know, adding like that extra poetry to your dye bath too. So, but stronger, I mean, of course, anything that is, has a higher pH is going to have more of a color shift mm -hmm. as you push it. So, mm -hmm. and then there's alkaline plants too, where you can get the wood ash. I know, um, juniper is one too using like the ash of juniper so even thinking about like for instance smudge sticks <laughs> you know or ash left over in different ways like mm. from certain plants how fascinating it sounds like you could make such a ceremony out of it like really really deeply yeah. meaningful because you could have your smudge stick that you made offerings to or like your incense bowl and you offered all these precious herbs and botanicals and you made prayers and wishes and and then you take that and you infuse that into water, almost like a spagyric elixir. And then, yeah, I mean, it's very ritualistic. There's also, you know, another thing too, is like part of the process that I've really loved bringing into my work with plant dyeing is the community aspect or the gathering aspect. And I feel like that's another way of working, you know, thinking seasonally and thinking about experiences rather than just the materiality that comes out of it. Because right. I think that adds more to the materials that come out of the process of coming together or mm. connecting to a place or mm. a time of year or thinking something that, you know, might not have shown itself in the same way. Because I think these colors and these color palettes from very specific place and time and the people that gather and make them. Yeah. So, so what if like, for example, let's say you and I got together and we got six other women together and we decided to have this group and we had like, let's say cotton bags or something mm -hmm. that were made and then we could go out and gather and maybe we could just make the, like the group intention, like around gathering like what are we gathering in our lives what are we putting into the bags and then you you would like knowing you you would collect fresh plant material you could even like ask the plants you know to like infuse some extra juice with whatever your intentions are and then you would get together and die together is that it's like similar to what you're recommending yeah I mean I actually do a lot of community events and collaborations with people so yeah I mean that's along the lines and sometimes like I love working with 
collaborative partners too, mm -hmm. like who have gifts in the plant world or, you know, skills to, to bring to it. So oftentimes like throughout the years, I've done a, several dinners to die for, or like Ooh. other taste palettes where we'll get together. And I love working with chefs, especially Berkeley. I feel very lucky because there's a bevy of amazing chefs to work yeah. with here. Yeah. And so thinking about biodiversity and even biodiversity of the taste palette and bringing mm -hmm. people together to be like, what are we, who, what are these plants and how many mm -hmm. different of citruses do we have right now and then tasting those together and having that experience and then mm. saving those rinds from those citrus plants and then creating a palette that comes out of that together too can mm. become a very synchronistic way of, of kind of learning and being together you know other things like in terms of ritual like even thinking individually like I did a project of a couple of years ago with a friend who's a florist and mm -hmm. what we did was create for valentine's day a bouquet of dye producing flowers and then people could send those bouquets to the ones they love but they were instructed one week later to come back with the bouquet as it was kind of on its end of <laughs> being right. enjoyed visually and to bring it back and use that same bouquet because the bouquets were tied with scarves and they came back and actually took that bouquet and learned how to make something beautiful from that into something else. So it's also really, you know, it was really wonderful to see kind of like that ripple effect of intention and gifting in a way to, wow. to see it continue. And then also to see all the people come together who had gotten these bouquets because they didn't previously know each other. <gasps> oh my God, that's so, so brilliant. You know, things like that. And then also, too, just, like, environmentally connecting with places. Like, I love hosting workshops, like, just thinking about salt water, like, bringing my classes down to, we did a workshop at Ocean Beach in San Francisco a couple of years ago, and really worked, we worked with the wood ash that were in the fire pits at the beach and collected salt water and died with a lot of the ice plants or succulents. Wow. Like, along the edge there and we worked with a local theater company to die they were doing a production of Undine about the mermaid you know like <laughs> the mermaids and it was really fun we dyed a bunch of the costumes like at the ocean with the salt water and with this in collaboration with these actors and actresses mm -hmm. and you know it's also like it becomes it becomes a very special process I also I do teach classes on kind of medicinal dying and thinking about personal um, relationships. And also my classes at California College of the Arts works on this conceptually is helping people to find plants that they find meaning in or that mm -hmm. remind them of people that, you know, kind of the storytelling aspects of it mm -hmm. and, you know, how you can use these palettes to express Mm. kind of authentic experiences or you know next level elements of of thinking and working in that way or mm. you know, so really fascinating that process so speaking of love and relationships because valentine's day is only a couple of months away <laughs> what what kinds of flowers and i'm thinking oh february it's kind of wintry like yeah. when you made those bouquet bou bouquets or you know, if someone were to, to try that out for themselves, yeah. what kinds of flowers would you use? Well, what we, I'm trying to think of the third element, but it was so beautiful what she ended up, this forest, what she ended up making was a big bouquet out of red roses, which okay. is, you know, that's the typical, and I loved working with them because, <laughs> because, and I put this project into spring because I'm a huge advocate for reconsidering what we consider waste and mm -hmm. so you know especially major holidays that work with plants like why I put the Bruce the blue spruce recipe into the winter section is because of growing up on a Christmas tree farm and seeing all these beautiful Christmas trees end up on the street after they're used and there's so much potential to keep working with it or to wow it before you just toss it away um oh and so same with these with these red roses too so many roses are gifted mm -hmm. at this one particular time of year and the red roses actually give you the most potent dyes from mm. the rose plant in general but you can also use the stems and the leaves too mm. Mm. and so we kind of separated all different parts of the rose like from the dark red flowers 
and got beautiful blues and pinks and purples from that, depending on the pH that you shipped with it. Wow. And then with the leaves, you can get greens and blacks and grays, again, depending on how you modify it. So even just the color palette from Red Roses alone is really amazing. But we also had dried cotton mm. in these bouquets. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And so we use the stems of cotton, the dried cotton, and it gives you beautiful pinks because it's filled with tannin as well. Mm-hmm. And then blacks and grays, like when you add a modifier, like iron to it. And there's a lot of other, I mean, there's so many different types of flowers you can work with, but, you know, typically like throughout, I have a lot of, I tried to put in flowers into every section of this book, but in general, like I love working with flowers in my own work, like day to day, because it's really a beautiful mm-hmm. way to collect, like even from your garden. And we have bees. And so being able to have plants that are great pollinators Mm -hmm. and also end up being really beautiful to look at in terms Mm -hmm. of, you know, cut flower bouquets. And then when you're done enjoying them, it's even cut flower bouquets, like being able to make dye palettes out of them. So like, yeah. I have a really cool idea. So I don't know if you've seen that we do these events called flower lounges. We've had Mm -hmm. like, I think 15 of them so far and a lot of different places. And we, our last one during the summer, we, oh my gosh, I think we had, oh my God, just like tens of thousands of flowers that we, so because for every event we, we we purchase like thousands of flowers for Mm -hmm. decorations and mandalas and hang them from the ceiling. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we like from day one, what we would do is then we would collect all the flowers, take all the petals off. And then the next morning we'd go to like the closest body of water make Mm -hmm. prayers, wishes, and then like offer the flowers into the water. But what I think would be amazing, it would be so fascinating is if, you know, maybe sometime next spring when we do another flower lounge in San Francisco, we collect, you know, we just make sure we have the red rose. We typically have red roses and marigolds and orchids and, but we could, we could select a special palette together and then we could come together the next day. And then instead of, tossing them into the ocean we can make something from them so that people could have like a real tangible thing to walk away with that experience from that's a beautiful way to work with flowers and also two marigolds are amazing guy <laughs> really oh my gosh we need to collaborate on this project in the springtime amazing guy. i mean there's so many flowers that you can work with that just make gorgeous colors and but um yeah and the ritualistic aspect too you know being able to think about these flowers on that level of you know both connecting back to that experience mm-hmm. but also thinking about their evolution yeah we could we could even add flower essences and essential oils into the dye baths for fun yeah, yeah. and some of these flowers too like speaking of medicinal like lavender mm-hmm. and like curating them for their essential like smells that might come out when you steam it or you know different aspects of that what just curi- out of curiosity going back to the marigolds mm-hmm. are, is it yellows and oranges or what colors are coming out of yeah, those? So or- well, depending on how concentrated, like if it's not very concentrated, you might get more yellow. But if you have a very concentrated dye bath, you should get a very beautiful, rich orange. <gasps> it's, it's a pretty light, stable wash bath dye too. Like it's a really nice, stable dye to work with. Mm. And we grow marigolds in our garden at California. We have a little community garden for the students. And so we grow a lot of them and dry them. And, you know, it's a great dye for right now in October, especially right after Day of the Dead. Mm. You know, reuse of that too. And then if you add iron to the water, it can shift to greens, um, oh. either light greens or dark greens, depending. Oh, beautiful. So, yeah, it's a really, it's a lovely, lovely palette. And you could even, so do you do like, for example, let's say you had a like a square piece of fabric, like a bag or a pillowcase. Yeah. Let's say you dyed the whole square in marigold and you get this brilliant orange. Mm-hmm. Can you then take half of it and just okay. dip dye it into the mordant? So you've got yeah. the green and the orange. Yeah. And something uh, you can totally do that. It's really easy to do. And another thing, this is something else that I talk about in my book as well, but um, you can also make with modifiers and mordants and literally paint on designs or screen prints which wow are very talented at but screen printing and say if you screen printed with an iron paste 
or citric acid like lemon or you know something alkaline and made a paste out of it and you you know let that paste set into your fiber or your fabric and then you dyed it or dyed it pre and then shifted it then you can get all these different colors interacting <gasps> and be very specific wow. Too. So that's one way, or you can just shift it. I mean, it's just really easy to shift these colors, which is, you know, a pro, <laughs> a pro aspect of working with the natural dyes because it's not as easy to get that wide of a range from, mm -hmm. some, you know, mm -hmm. completely going with a new dye bath. So, wow, fascinating. Yeah. So, you, I mean, you could have one plant and then based on the different pHs that you're working with, create a whole like rainbow, is oh, what you're yeah. saying, right? Yep. Yeah. yeah. And okay, so let's talk about because Christmas is coming and I find the whole idea of spruce dyeing fascinating. What can listeners, you know, so let's say we have hundreds of listeners who have spruce Christmas trees. Mm -hmm. What can they do with them before they toss them out? Yeah, so what you can do, another like lovely thing about this too, is that you don't necessarily need a moment, like you can shift it if you, you know, want to create different color ranges. Uh, let me what just... Let let me interject because maybe yeah. I realize maybe some listeners might not understand what a, what a mordant is or yeah. what shifting is. So I should say additional mordant because mordant is Latin for the word to bite. And it's actually something that you can add to mord or means mouth. So anyway, so it's a way of your dye and your fiber meeting and biting together and like actually connecting on a better le level for light fastness so meaning that your your dye is better when it goes in front of sunlight or wash fastness meaning that if it gets washed it's not as much color is going to rinse out so some plants don't need to have anything additionally added to make this bite happen because it might already have like for instance tannic acid in it and tannins are a mordant they can help the color in the dye bond or the dye and the fiber bond Another plant-based mordant is oxalic acid. So like in oxalis or in sourgrass, that oxalic acid that's already in that plant also acts as a mordant. But a lot of plants have tannins in them. And so those, those plants are really fun to explore because then it's a really easy way of just taking the plant, putting it in water, adding like tea has tannin in it right so you can do a tea dye really easily because mm. of the tannins and it will bind to a whole range of fiber and so loquat leaves have a lot of tannin in them mm. uh acorns have a lot of tannin in them but if you want to shift the colors that's another thing so iron can act as both a mordant because you're either using plant mordants or metal mordants. And the only two metal mordants that I ever work with, and I still work with them very cautiously, is and on a very low ratio compared to a lot of other dyers. I try to use as little as possible to get a result, but alum salt and iron. So okay. those are the two metal mordants. But there are a lot of dye books out there, and especially older dye books, I would say, that suggest a wider range of mordants to work with, like chrome and tin and copper, etc. Those can and, be toxic, right? Yeah. So you have to kind of use your your whole system sense of you know how you think about what you work with, and even tan. I mean, tannins can be tricky for you and toxic, and so can iron. And you know, so even thinking in dosages as to an alum. Mm -hmm as an irritant we know and then there's debates about how much it can affect your own body too so you always want to be listening in terms of medicine <laughs> be listening right. to yourself because sometimes plants even if it's a plant that might not even be toxic to somebody else could be toxic to you well it's kind yeah. of like like the the painters of the old days right like some of the painters would get a little bit loopy from the things okay. that they were painting with and, <laughs> and yeah. there's this the whole like thing about aluminum and deodorants and antiperspirants and creating some sort of yeah. so it's all, well, I, mean, I talk about this in my book too but it's always good just because it's natural doesn't necessarily mean that it's good for you mm -hmm. and so being able to just you know start small it's always good to start small and then to you know take good care of yourself and to listen to yourself in terms of what plants make sense and what don't I mean again one of the 
one of the biggest allergic reactions that I've seen in my 10 years of teaching was actually mm -hmm. from a student who was a weaver working with turmeric dyed. Mm -hmm. And mm. she was, it was just because she was allergic to turmeric. And so for most of us, putting turmeric on our skin is actually beneficial. But for this one particular student, you know, it was not <laughs> so you know again it's not a one size you also have to know your own alchemy in terms of like what plants you work with and you know everybody everybody's you know so yeah that's that's interesting I was just yeah. speaking to an, an herbalist who was talking about I was talking to Rosemary Gladstar actually and she was saying that how fascinating it was that plants that we find in absolute abundance are typically the ones that we can be consuming every day on a regular basis and plants that are much much more powerful to be used only in like certain conditions are much much more rare on the planet and I just out of curiosity I was thinking about poisonous plants and I wonder like I'm thinking okay you know just like running through my head the different poisonous plants that I know and I can't imagine yeah. that they have a lot of color have okay. you worked with any poisonous plants or are they mostly white yeah, and things that working with poisonous plants especially the ones that because I have kids you know like right is a beautiful dye but because they look so edible and they're so they're toxic I don't like to work with them just because I don't I just energetically I don't want something that looks that appetizing around my my children were much smaller and they actually have sure. a literacy from like foraging <laughs> with me but you know they're they're always sort of you know they love working with plants and they know that there's limits to them etc but yeah so cokeberry is like a poisonous plant that I don't like to work with there's also like I love kind of too considering just different elements of what's poisonous to some and not to others because mm -hmm. there's also like if you look at native Californian dye plants you'll see that native Californians would work with poison oak as a as a staple dye and it's a very strong dye it's a beautiful black but they were immune and most of us are not immune to poison oak so before looking at historically what was used in a region even consider like you know common sense of what was good for some may not be good for others too, mm -hmm. you know, so that's, it's another kind of interesting example. And then additionally, I've done a lot of research and kind of thinking and systems thinking and work with plants that are phytoremediators or bioremediators. So some plants, like we have a lot of wild fennel in the Bay Area, and I love working with wild fennel. It's just one of my favorite colors. And it is a strong phytoremediator, so it will take toxins out of the soil and the leaves and the plant will then take it up. And so even considering where you harvest or where you forage um, and even what's in your own soil before you work with the plant can determine its toxicity. So wow. if you're foraging wild fennel from the steel mill area of West Berkeley versus mm -hmm. out in you know, West Marin where you may not have the same soil you know, contaminants is also something to consider. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of different ways of thinking about it, but you know, another part of this research that I did, it was with a architecture landscape academic group in France from a university there. And so we were studying urban gardens close to freeways. And I was particularly looking at dye plants, mm -hmm. um, kind of an intermediate element of being able to clean soil and the community coming together to do something with it but not eating it and you still have to be you know have to be really careful and depending on how toxic soil is but plants you know plants have so much power to them and there's so many different ways that they absorb their environment and that we then absorb the environment through them and mm -hmm. how we tend and take care of them and how we tend to take care of the whole mm -hmm. all of this um, mm. process of toxicity. So that's the big picture answer, I guess. Wow. Well, yeah, so much to think about. There's a lot, there's a lot to consider. <laughs> I think we, we just circling back, I think we forgot to to describe the the spruce, the Christmas trees. So mm -hmm. let's say I have a Christmas tree with spruce and say an old white t-shirt. Oh yeah. Okay. What should I do? Yeah, so spruce, I guess this is how we got into mordants because we sought to talk about what a mordant <laughs> is 
was and I went into toxicity. But anyway, so spruce, you can actually just take some of the branches. And if you have pruners, you can tear it up with your hands, depending on how you want to work with it. But you can also just, you know, kind of break them up into smaller pieces so that you can get more of the molecules out of the plant. And you basically put it into water and slowly bring it up and simmer until you start to see color kind of come out of the the leaf or the needles and the branches themselves and it should go from kind of a yellowy peachy color to darker peach and even red depending wow fascinating you're not going to get red <laughs> per se mm-hmm. on your textiles um you'll get more of a, like a pinky kind of you know brown kind of russet red I would say wow. and so those are and that was that's without adding anything but adding a little bit of alkalinity to your water will push the warmth of that color too wow so again being able to push the pH and yeah it's a really it's a really beautiful dye to work with and then again if you add iron you can shift that color into something that's more you know greenish gray I would say so, and How recipe, fascinating. Yeah, the recipe I have in this book is for blue spruce, and it's with adding a little bit of alum salts and then a little bit of iron to set the color even further onto wool, but it also creates this really pretty kind of greenish gray color. Wow. So so, yeah. so we could we could gift everyone and we they could gift everyone in their family a beautiful cotton white scarf and then at the end of the holidays all come together and figure out the color they want to dye it. Yeah, that's true. You can. Yeah. Oh, so fun. Yeah. So it works. I mean, it especially works beautifully on the wood. Yeah. If people <laughs> give their wool. <laughs> but it's a really nice combination is the is the spruce with the wool. Wow. Yeah. Wow. But, yeah, oh my gosh, we didn't even get into fabrics yet and, and, and colors. So like, let's say, you know, just thinking in terms of color therapy, because I think mm-hmm. a lot of times we, we may not think first of the plant, we may not, you know, you're coming from a very organic perspective of like, what's available right now, what can I go and forage for mm-hmm. the person who's a little more green and isn't necessarily foraging, but maybe they're thinking like, I love orange right now, or like green is a color that really nourishes me. Maybe we could just go through the rainbow really quick and you could throw Mm -hmm. out some of your favorite plants that you love for Mm -hmm. specific colors. Yeah. Well, red, I mean, depending too on access to different plants too. Right, right. You know, because you can always buy bulk or go to an herbalist or, you know, there's different ways you don't necessarily have to forage or harvest or grow everything yourself. So reds plant-based reds that I love to work with matter root is you know Mm. that's a favorite because it is such a powerful ancient primary plant we grow our own matter root but it can take like three to five years before you harvest (laughs) it and it's a really it's a lovely you can get it sometimes from herbalist but it's a great plant to get from you know the right textile supplier too and it's just really fun to work with so Matter root is a great red. Other reds like the avocado pits, if you really, really steep them up and you let your fiber soak, I've gotten the most beautiful reds from avocado pits too. Mm-hmm. And I would say slowness is your friend. So really <laughs> soaking the dye and then even putting it into a bucket or into a bowl and making sure your fibers are submerged and letting it steep up to a week or so. And, and how do you keep it from getting moldy? After a week, that's when it starts to get kind of moldy. But some of these, some of these side dots are quite astringent too and hold, you know, after time. But check in on them, keep them in a dark, cool place and keep them covered and don't let them stay without you. And yeah, so let's see. And then orange, marigolds, beautiful orange, onion skins too. I always love onion skins because they're such you know, they're not considered oftentimes and just going to the produce section of your favorite grocery or health food store, you know, they're often happy to hand them over to you too for bigger projects. So, and Coreopsis, Coreopsis is a really beautiful 
plant-based flower orange to work with. Yellows, like wild fennel. I love working with wild fennel. There's so many, it's a predominant color in nature. There's the yellows that you can get from all these different plants. Even if you don't think you would get yellow from it, sometimes you end up getting yellow. So a lot of flowers and leaves can give you some really gorgeous yellows, but passion vine too. I love working with the yellows from that. And again, aloe, as I mentioned, is really beautiful yellow and oxalis, which gives you like that fluorescent pop. You know, there's a lot of, it's abundant. I can't even tell you how many yellows I love. And then green, green's really easy to get from shifting colors, especially with iron. So like the green that you can get from wild fennel, for instance, if you add iron to it as a favorite. And, you know, you can kind of go down the list with a lot of plants and it's really like the iron combination that's yellow already. Okay, just to interject, tell me about just a little bit about indigo. Like sometimes I've seen indigo, beautiful greens and then the more typical blue. So when do you get green from indigo? Japanese indigo and so the Japanese indigo you can just with cold water I have a recipe for this in my book too but you have to grow it and it's an annual so it it's basically it's really quick to grow it has a good germination and you can harvest basically you plant it in March and you harvest it from June through like November I'm just kind of doing the last harvest right now and you can just take these fresh indigo leaves which look kind of like basil and you put them into a blender or chop them up really finely and then just like nice cool water and you can submerge your fiber into that nice cool water with the indigo paste the fresh indigo paste and oxidize it and you can get gorgeous greens turquoise colors that are really unparalleled to any other color that I've seen and so yeah that's a great it's a really pretty way to get some greens. And then with indigo in a reduction bath, it looks green until it oxidizes if your indigo vat is healthy. And then it should keep going darker blue depending on how much you oxidize it. And then if you add a yellow to it or over dye it, that's when you can get some really gorgeous green. So, wow. Yeah. And then blue indigo, <laughs> it's a lovely plant, amazing plant to work with. There's tons of varieties. Indigo, organic indigo powder is typically tropical variety, which has more pigment to it. What we can grow in the Bay Area is Japanese indigo because it's suited for our climate and there's a lot of it being grown right now in community factors and you know smaller industrial factors that are happening in the Bay Area right now which is awesome and then purples so many different ways of getting purples (laughs) but you know you can work with blackberries and a little bit of alum salts and iron to stabilize it and same with roses red rose petals too there's a lot of plants like as I mentioned sweet gum leaves that give you that antique pink on their own and then if you add iron to it it can go into purples that are really beautiful too um acorns I was working with a lot of acorns this weekend and you can also get some really beautiful purples with acorn and iron too so tannins with iron can sometimes give you gorgeous blacks purples and blues do you ever work with alkanet yeah we work with alkanet i actually used to work with it quite a bit but it's a pretty smelly dye it's kind of stinky right (laughs) it's a really great color and it's very stable too but it it smells like gym socks in our (laughs) it's one of those dyes that we've kind of put to you know it's individually a great one to work with and i work outside so it's pretty it's pretty good to work with outside but when you're in a more contained environment it can get tough over time (laughs) happening on that front (laughs) yeah but it's endless I mean there are so many different gorgeous plants to work with to get all those rainbow colors and then also too within that like I love working with natural dyes because even the spectrum where you're looking at all these different grays for instance because you can get a lot of grays in plant dyeing but I think you're your eyes become very sensitive to color because these colors are so unique and you can even arrange all of these grays in rainbow order. You know, it's like, that to me is like the amazing part of the living color, you know, like working with these molecules that are alive and not synthetic. So, wow. Yeah, wow. it's always, you have the pigments that are in these, or the dyes that are happening from these plants are always the color you're getting and the opposite color. So they're, they're always shifting and changing in different, you know, quantities and light and on different fibers too. Wow. It's just like pure alchemy. 
It totally is. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So I can see why you love it. It's just like something that's always changing and transforming, mm-hmm. and you're constantly learning, right, from nature I'm and. Learning. I know it's like, and even just from one plant from year to year, I feel like I I learned so much, or even die back to die back. You know, it's like. Wow. Well, I. Yeah. I I am just so fascinated by you and your work and I hope I hope someday we can collaborate together. I absolutely recommend that people take your classes and get your book. I'm just going to read a description of this incredible book. It's called Natural Color and it's a beautiful book of seasonal projects for using the brilliant spectrum of colors derived from plants to naturally dye your clothing and home textiles. It's organized by season. And the photo- the photography is insane and it's so gorgeous. And Sasha goes through the whole full range of plant dyes from commonly found fruits, flowers, trees, herbs, and has accompanying seasonal projects using sustainable methods and a variety of techniques. She shows you how to apply the limitless color possibilities to your home and your wardrobe and she's got step-by-step instructions with breakouts on techniques like shibori, dip dye, and block painting. And so highly, highly recommended to check out her book. And, and then in terms of finding Sasha, the best way is to contact her on her website, which is Sasha, and her last name is spelled D-U-E-R-R.com. And she's also on Instagram and Twitter. And she's got amazing photos and projects and gorgeous things on Instagram. So definitely connect with her there. Is there anything else you'd like to add, Sasha, or anything I forgot to ask or any words of wisdom that you find yourself commonly sharing with people? I would just say, no. well, I'm very happy to have done this podcast with you. It was a pleasure. Mm-hmm. And I would just say to, as people are working through their practice with plants, is just to remain open. You know, that's the, the biggest part and to mm-hmm. practice, practice, practice and, you know, to enjoy the process. So I love that. I think we could yeah. take that lesson like really deep into our lives. It's like just as we stay open to what can happen, right? It's like staying open to transformation and change and alchemy of all that's possible, right? <laughs> it's great advice. <laughs> Fantastic well, advice. I needed that today. <laughs> I needed to. <laughs> okay, well, thank you so much. I'm really, really happy to have been a part of this. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for listening to The Flower Lounge. I'm Katie Hess, and we'll be releasing a new podcast every Wednesday. If you like what you heard or you know someone who might be touched by our conversation, share it with them. And don't forget to subscribe. To find out what your favorite flowers mean about you, take the quiz at lotusway.com.